Okay. Welcome to Sunday Morning at the Marxist Library, a project of the Institute for the Critical Study of Society at the Niebel Proctor Marxist Library, or ICSS for short, or sometimes NPML. My name is Eugene Rule, and I will be your host for today's program with Harry Targ on the struggle for ideological hegemony. Now, we all live in cyberspace right now, but our spiritual and physical home is at 6501 Telegraph Avenue in Oakland, about a mile south of the UC Berkeley campus. And normally I would have provided coffee and donuts, uh, mm -hmm. but you're gonna to have to fend for yourself today. But while you're getting settled, let me give you some background on our library and our institute. The NPML library is built around a collection of books and manuscripts from two remarkable individuals, Karl Niebel, a Marxist economist who fled Nazi Germany with his wife Elizabeth and made a new home in California, and Roscoe Proctor, a uh, Texas farm worker, longshoreman, and member of the Communist Party's political committee. Since our founding, we have served not only as a research library, but also a community center, providing affordable meeting space for diverse community groups involved in our common struggle for racial and gender equality and for socialism. Our institute was founded about 20 years ago as the research and educational arm of the library to further these goals. Some of us are members of specific parties and tendencies, others are not. So our workshops, forums, and publications do not follow any party line, nor do they represent any kind of group consensus on the issues involved. We are united, however, in our respect for the work of Karl Marx and our belief that his work will remain as important for the class struggles of the future as they have been for the past. And we continue to draw inspiration from the words of Karl Marx's 11th thesis on Feuerbach that the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. Our speaker today exemplifies this Marxian principle. Harry Targ spent over 50 years as a professor of political science at Purdue University, a public working class institution, and for the past 30 years has been active in the Committees of Correspondence for Democracy and Socialism, or CCDS, for which he currently serves as co-chair. And I have asked the other co-chair, Gary Hicks, um, who is also a member of our institute, to introduce our speaker. And Gary, are you prepared to say a few words here? Yeah. I don't have much to add to what you had to say, uh, Gene. Um, I've, known, I've known Harry through his readings <clears throat> since, um, since the mid-90s when he was writing a whole lot of stuff about Cuba, as well as academic, academic uh, issues around, around the campus and that type of thing. Um, I got to know him personally and better after uh, 2015, when I, be, you know, when I started playing more of a leadership role in CCDS and also att was, was attending conferences and particularly one memorable conference in 2017 around, around the, the issue of China. And um, I'm here to, because I wanna hear what he has to say about uh, what's going on at Purdue because I've been, I've been watching, I've been watching this controversy um, since the 1970s, actually, in terms of every 
every once in a while, the, the academy comes up with some kind of nifty propositions or uh, what's his name? Um, you know, basically things like this critical race theory now, Ebonics, for example, in another in another period of time, in another period of time, I was dealing dealing with recombinant DNA. Um, so these and these are all these are all basically um, ways of the folks who run the show to try to um, basically get us to go along with how they think. So that's up, and I'm I'm going to leave it at that right now. I'm going to let um, I'm going to let Harry explain to us the latest episode on this kind of stuff. Hey, Harry. Okay. Okay. Well, go ahead. Gary will talk for about forty-five minutes, I think, and then we'll okay. move forward. So it's over to you, Harry. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate uh, particularly uh, Norma's suggestion to you all to invite me to speak. Uh, the kind words of Jean and Raj and the uh, support they gave me as a result of my technological fears. And hopefully I will be able to go through this slideshow without uh, glitches or me pushing the wrong button someplace. And thanks for Gary to Gary, uh, who's been an interesting and instructive colleague in uh, the committees of correspondence. Just a few more words by way of introduction before uh, the slide set. Uh, as Eugene pointed out, I was a faculty member in the Department of Political Science at Purdue University uh, for 52 years. In uh, 2013, the former governor of Indiana, Mitch Daniels, uh, was appointed to be president of Purdue University. Uh, Daniels had served two terms, very popular, as governor of Indiana. Before that, he, uh, he, he had been a director of OMB uh, with, uh, in the Bush administration. He had estimated that the cost of the Iraq war would be $50 billion rather than the three trillion that it has become. And then he returned home and ran successfully to serve as governor of Indiana. As in the state constitution, the governor selects the board of trustees of Purdue with a couple of exceptions. And he, uh, he selected the board of trustees and after he left his second term as governor, the Board of Trustees coincidentally uh, appointed him to be president of Purdue University. From 2013 and beyond, and I'll refer to a couple of puzzling developments, um, I initially saw his activities as unique to his political ideology and associations. I initially saw in uh, Purdue University, a state, insti state public institution as innovative and moving in the wrong direction. And I began to write and uh, try to organize other faculty against some of these developments. Uh, lo and behold, as I began to study Purdue more, I realized that the changes that were occurring in higher education were not unique to Purdue, but were part of uh, uh, national phenomena, were part of campaigns and programs initiated by very powerful political forces, particularly the Koch Foundation. And while there may be regional differences and be interesting to hear about California, that uh, there were common themes occurring in the transformation of higher education that, um, uh, that concerned me. Secondly, and I'll only briefly allude to this, I began to think that the institutions that generate the ideology that most, most of us accept and live by, the narratives that we're taught to believe about the United States and the world, 
uh, put in a prominent place, both the educational system, K through 12 and higher education, and the media. And I also um, became concerned with the transformation of our local newspaper, which was bought, bought out by Gannett. Uh, the copy uh, was transformed uh, dramatically. Local coverage was, was reduced significantly. And more and more stories came to us in our local community from USA Today. And again, I thought originally that this was perhaps unique to uh, West Lafayette, Indiana, and a few other, uh, few other uh, community newspapers around the country. And lo and behold, as I began to study and observe, I discovered that there's been a radical transformation of uh, print media throughout the United States. Uh, uh, a, a newspapers, community newspapers have declined from 4,000 in the U.S. to 2,000. There have been thousands of reporters left let go. And people who write about the media now talk about news deserts. So you have transformation in perhaps two of the leading institutions that generate the uh, concepts and beliefs that most people in the United States uh, are sort of socialized to accept. I'm gonna concentrate on higher education and end up with the case study of Purdue. But I think this is part of you know, my explanation as to why I got involved in this subject matter. Many of you, um, and here is a quote from Accuracy in Academia, which is one of these right-wing higher education watchdogs that has been in existence for many years. I'll refer to some others. Higher education groups, faculty members, and journalists portray ongoing efforts to counter critical race theory as authoritarian, heavy-handed, unfair, and illegal. Um, however, they fail to recognize that liberal indoctrination on college campuses has rubbed American parents the wrong way. And uh, this kind of uh, notion of liberal indoctrination, as Gary alluded to, is a characteristic feature of public discourse on higher education and really K through 12 uh, at, at this point in time. And um, activists from the right have latched on to critical race theory, uh, of which they know little as an academic subfield, as a vehicle for challenging um, any curricula that addresses seriously the flaws that exist in the American past and the American present. We all know for starters, some of the theoretical underpinnings of what uh, I would uh, happily call ideological hegemony. Of course, Marx told us early on that all history is the history of class struggle and the ideas of the ruling class are the ruling ideas. Gramsci introduced for us the concept of ideological hegemony and suggested to us that ruling classes ruled not only by force with police and armies, but by consent. And it's the consent part that concerns me here and concerns me about the transformation of higher, uh, ed, uh, higher education. And as I suggested at the outset, two institutions that are central to the creation and maintenance of ideological hegemony are the educational systems and the media. Let me say as a kind of footnote that we in CCDS and those of you in whatever groups that you are a part of are very much concerned about the 2022 elections are very much concerned about what happened January 6th, are very much concerned about the uh, spread of Trumpism and white supremacy around the country. And these concerns are all justified and important. But my feeling is that along with these concerns, I think it's important to pay attention to the less visible transformations of uh, institutions like the educational system uh, and, and the mass media. That in a sense, below the radar screen, we are seeing some fundamental changes occurring 
that in the end will have dramatic impacts on the sort of our overarching concern with elections and uh, stopping the white supremacist uh, uh, coalitions within the United States. Uh, more on ideological hegemony. I started teaching in the 1960s and um, I was very sympathetic with the writings of Herbert Marcuse, who talked about in one book, repressive desublimation, in a sense, using a certain conception of pleasure to manipulate and create consent among a population. His famous book called One Dimensional Man that suggests how public consciousness seeks to sort of destroy the contradictory character of social and political reality or our understanding of the contradictory character of social and political reality. Later on, of course, many of us read um, Herman and Chomsky's book on manufacturing consent. And there are libraries of books, not only about higher education, but on media control and manipulation. And many of course were inspired by the Herman and Chomsky book. In addition, I was affected by some of the writings of Eric Fromm and is theorizing a sort of Frankfurt School interpretation, uh, uh, connecting class with mass psychology and the one book that I still remember, Escape from Freedom. And in terms of um, political um, institutional pressure, uh, to create ideological hegemony in higher education. Of course, we all remember the era of McCarthyism, and I particularly find Ellen Schreiker's book, No Ivory Tower, is terribly uh, useful. And these, of course, are just examples, and we could all think of many, many more. I should add it in case I forget, in recent times, the writing of Nancy McLean, Democracy in Chains, and she draws the connection between the Koch brothers and their various institutions like ALEC, ACTA, uh, state policy networks, and policy changes, including changes in K through 12 and higher education. And we need, uh, we will in this uh, remaining time revisit that just a little bit. Um, Carl Davidson, a, a, a member of CCDS, has at the bottom of his um, uh, email the following uh, quote from Gramsci, and I think it's terribly poignant for our discussion. Ideologies are anything but arbitrary. They are real historical facts which must be combated and their nature as instruments of domination revealed, not for reasons of morality, but for reasons of political struggle in order to make the governed intellectually independent of the governing, in order to destroy one hegemony and create an, uh, another. So ideology, in a sense, are material forces. And if I'm right, that ideologies uh, uh, are, are institutionalized in higher education and in the media, then that makes those inst institutions terribly important and venues for political struggle to create real change. Here is just um, one image to talk about media control. And again, that's the subject for another occasion, uh, this particular image, and you could find millions, of, uh, a lot other, not necessarily millions. In 1983, 50 corporations owned 90, uh, own 90 percent of the media. In 2012, six corporations controlled 90% of the media. And look at the media concentration in a little over a decade of, of radio. And in case I forget later on, I used to, I must confess, in the 90s, listen to Rush Limbaugh over the lunch hour. And I remember him saying one day, the only institution we don't control is the university. So um, I remembered that quote for years and years, and thanks for Rush to, uh, for stimulating really uh, much of this presentation. Um, I was a graduate student in political science in the early mid 1960s, and um, I gravitated towards the study of political socialization. And uh, while people might dismiss, as I often did, political science as 
uh, an intellectual body of work that is useful for us. There are some con uh, concepts that uh, I learned about in the 60s that are self-evident but worthy of consideration. The first, political socialization. And I remember being in a class with a professor who would become my advisor, and he said it would be uh, very useful, constructive for people to do dissertations on political socialization. And I leaned over to a friend and said, what does that term mean? And once I learned the term, I sort of was channeled into doing a dissertation on how and what children learn about international relations. And it was at a point in time when there was uh, a lot of research literature about kids' political socialization from in Scandinavia, Africa, and Japan. And so there was comparative data. And lo and behold, the kids I studied from the Chicago area uh, developed much more sensitivity and acceptance, say, of the concept of war, the inevitability of war, than uh, uh, students from Norway uh, or Japan, and as I remember, even the study of Germany. And political socialization then uh, would be roughly defined in how and what institutions affect our political knowledge of the world. And the literature then, and I suppose it's not too different today, was that we learn many of our historical narratives or political cues from family, from media, from the educational system, and from our peers. Kind of self-evident, uh, but it was in a sense an eye-opener for me. And back in those days, um, the literature tended to indicate that, oh, 50, 60% of the American people identify with the political party of their parents. So, you know, this one item uh, indicator of the transmission of political information from, uh, from, uh, from uh, parents uh, to children uh, was the role of the family. The broader concept that also I was exposed to was political culture the dominant uh, orientations of a society, the values and beliefs that people in the main have in reference to their society, uh, how they as individuals relate to that society and how their society compares in contrast uh, with others. So therefore, even from the perspective of con conventional political science literature, there is a growing uh, interest in how and why people uh, learn uh, what, they, uh, what they believe. And so I wrote selective presentations of history and the arts is provided by formal content and repeated rituals, such as the pledge to the flag, competitive sports, so, uh, routinized social life, such as dances, in addition, as theorists as Jim Berlin, Jim Berlin was a dear friend of mine who wrote about the educational, uh, transforming higher educational system of the early part of the 20th century. And he discovered education, even K through 12, as well as higher education, was fundamentally transformed to produce workers who were engaged in the uh, latest phase of industrialization. So that there was a connection between education and the needs of capital for economic development. Educational theorists have pointed out that the character of education develops and changes as the economy changes from competitive to industrial to monopoly capitalism. So this process of political socialization creates a dominant political culture and the dominant political culture in the main is trans, uh, transmitted through the educational and media institutions that are central to our, uh, to our lives. Uh, I have reference to Thomas Kuhn here, who wrote an interesting book called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. And uh, my takeaway from him, his work is a little different perhaps than, uh, than his intention. Uh, but Kuhn was arguing that in various fields, and he was wrote, writing mostly about the hard sciences, 
there are dominant paradigms that are established, that is, ways of thinking about the subject matter, and people who engage in research and teaching in their particular fields largely operate within the context of these dominant paradigms. And these dominant paradigms get institutionalized in professional associations, in curricula, in colleges and universities. And until there's a kind of uprising against the legitimacy of these paradigms, certain paradigms hold true. The one example I would make before we move on that's relevant to us is that social science, sociology, political science, and Eugene could tell us about anthropology, bought in in the 1960s to certain models of development and modernization. The crudest form was Walter Rostow's um, non-communist um, uh, manifesto, I forget the main part of the title of his book, which argued that a development occurred naturally um, as it did in Europe, and uh, there's a need to build a broad middle class. And uh, the Rostow modernization theory uh, got the ear of the Kennedy administration and Secretary of Defense McNamara and fed into their argument that if the United States intervened in Vietnam, we in fact could help build a healthy middle class and Vietnam could develop the way that Europe did in the 16th, 17th and 18th century. So paradigms matter. And when you read some of Chomsky's, Chomsky's early work, like the New Mandarins, he particularly attacks his colleagues like Rostow at MIT for developing, uh, developing and supporting paradigms that essentially serve to justify United States imperialism. In the higher education, I'm beginning to revisit Clark Kerr, who many of you are probably more familiar with than I, and he writes about and advocates for the idea of a multiversity, right? And in the 1960s, uh, he celebrated the development of science and technology, um, the broad um, accessibility of education to promote the dominant uh, political culture. And he does say directly that universities, therefore, in terms of science and technology and the promotion of the dominant, dominant ideological paradigm could serve as instrumentalities of American national security. And we get, begin to see resistance to this in the 1960s as you're, uh, uh, as you're uh, all aware of. And part of my argument is that when I get to the end of the story in civic literacy, I think the people who promote civic literacy or who promote the idea of prohibiting um, uh, critical ideas like critical race theory are responding to the upheaval, upheaval and transformation of higher education, which began in the 1960s. I like to use the metaphor that was uh, uh, the title of a book on labor, uh, Contested Terrain, to suggest that the university system in the 60s and the 70s, and we're of that era, um, uh, consisted of contested terrain. New curricula challenged old paradigms, and we see the establishment, even at Purdue University, of African-American studies, peace studies, women and gender studies, and other such gender studies programs. We see classes challenging the traditional wisdom about American ex exceptionalism, which so pervades um, uh, American society and the media today. Um, it contested terrain led to this Rush Limbaugh quote, the only institution we don't control is the university. And uh, contested terrain meant that the right wing began to organize against it. And here's a partial list. The National Association of Scholars, uh, David Horwitz and his 101 Dangerous Professors, uh, the Association of Trustees and Administrators, I think I've got that title wrong, which uh, has given awards to President Mitch Daniels from Purdue University, um, the State Policy Network, and, um, and behind all of this, Alan the American Legislative Executive Council, 
which brings state legislators together to plan ways to transform public policy at the level of the state. And for many of us, of course, this has been below the political radar screen as we do our work diligently to try and move politicians at the national level to the left. But Alec understood that most public policies in reference to education and social welfare and so on uh, are, uh, are carried out by state governments rather than national governments. And again, that story is told in a very compelling way by Nancy McLean in her book, Democracy and Chains. Therefore, education from uh, kindergarten through the university, university is increasingly designed to instill the ideology of the dominant political culture and to create a 21st century workforce to serve the needs of monopoly finance global capital. Enter the shock doctrine. Uh, you probably are all aware of Nancy, uh, Nancy, um, uh, I, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on her name, um, Naomi Klein, I'm sorry, Naomi Klein's book, The Shock Doctrine. And in it, she argues that significant and apocryphal change uh, results often from crises, whether they be economic, political, and environmental. And she gets the idea from the free market economist, Milton Friedman, who said, we ought to keep our ideas going. We ought to keep our institutions advocating um, uh, neoliberalism and free market economics alive. And at such point as a, pol a political or economic crisis occurs, we can step forward and agitate for and collectively institutionalize, institutionalize radical changes. In that regard, um, the shock doctrine, um, I think is particularly relevant to the last two or three years in the transformation of higher education. Just as a backdrop before the last two or three years, but related to it, so public support, state support for public higher education has declined significantly. That decline began in the, 1980s and uh, has sig significantly increased. That is the decline uh, ever since that uh, point of time. Uh, in addition, um, universities are facing the crisis of a declining pool of uh, university age potential college students. Uh, further, universities are have to rely more on international students and the paradox and irony of the US new Cold War with China is that Chinese students, um, the number of Chinese students coming to the United States has uh, radically uh, declined. And with all this, um, there's a declining uh, expectation or uh, acceptance of the idea that a higher education is a public good. And with all this, as a result of COVID, the, um, the demands for change to overcome these crises has increased. There's a, been a sustained shift from humanities, liberal arts, education, education that doesn't uh, lead immediately to pecuniary gain, either for the university or, uh, or for individual students, to STEM fields. Uh, there's been an increase, again, uh, uh, efforts of universities like Purdue University to uh, secure military uh, contracts. And there's been efforts to overcome the declining pool of tuition paying uh, students. And of course, we all know of the enormous student debt that young people have occurred. I found a memo from Goldman Sachs. Um, I think it was from last December that pointed out that in the post-coronavirus period, there might be an opportunity, i.e. the shock doctrine, to shift more to online forms of learning. And that's one of the dimensions of change that are occurring uh, at various universities. Purdue has launched to the dismay of its faculty, what's called uh, Purdue Global. 
a global online university uh, structure with no control or input or relationship to the Purdue campus. Uh, the only rel uh, connection between Purdue Global and the university is the brand name of Purdue. Paradoxically, Purdue Global is kind of light in the game. There's uh, University of Phoenix, there's, uh, I think it's Southeastern New Hampshire, and a whole host of other universities that are desperately trying to institutionalize online programs, allegedly for non-traditional students. So these and other problems that we could talk about have been uh, um, exacerbated by the COVID crisis. And the shock doctrine, I think, is particularly important. Okay, civic literacy at Purdue. Mitch Daniels announced, uh, I think, uh, two years ago that the Board of Trustees will in initiate a civic literacy requirement for all students. And he claimed that data shows that American young people uh, cannot name the three branches of government. I think there was probably one study that uh, ACTA produced or referred to that made this claim. I don't know if there's been any effort to replicate the study uh, um, or to sort of develop more conclusively that this was true. Uh, of course, no, nobody that I know of has raised the point that if students can't identify the three branches of government, uh, why, what's happened to K through 12 and what about declining funding for public education. Uh, the faculty at Purdue uh, responded to Daniels and the Board of Trustees by saying, why? What's the need for civic literacy? How do you define civic li literacy? Uh, how should the a requirement be fulfilled? And as a result, the University Senate, a uh, Senate made up of faculty with no real power, voted against the idea. So this was I think maybe in the spring of 2019. In April, um, the Board of Trustees announced that a new civic literacy program was going to be established. So in violation of, uh, uh, of the will of the faculty, if you will, and with very little defense of the need for it, um, the uh, Daniels administration declared that civic literacy would be the law. All incoming students would have to fulfill civic literacy. I was interested in where civic literacy came from. And I found a 2015 report produced by ACTA called A Crisis in Civic Education. And in the preface to uh, the report, uh, a professor wrote that in the contemporary world of conflicts between religious, ethnic, and racial groups, Americans need to be re reminded of their history, quote, especially as that history conveys our nation's stunning success successful recipe based on the documents of our founding for an inclusive and tolerant society. So she's found um, stunning successes in American history in the issues that we're all concerned about. And the report also indicated, I thought was interesting, that um, community service programs don't cut the mustard in terms of civic literacy. They give students little insight into how our system of, of government uh, works and what roles they must fill as citizens of a democratic republic. So, you know, uh, this is the, in short, the civic literacy uh, story. And it's clearly from my point of view a, uh, a story about uh, Purdue University wanting to institutionalize a program that essentially, to put it crudely, would educate young people uh, to the narrative of American exceptionalism. In a sense, if you work, if you think about the 30 or 40 years or the 50 years that I've been talking about, to respond to uh, the contested terrain of the 60s and 70s when new and innovative programs were developed at college campuses, often as a result of demands from students to seriously address racism, sexism, the war system, 
environmental uh, despoilation. And it seems to me the civic literacy campaign was a campaign to expunge and overturn that historic contested terrain. That was the way universities more or less uh, operated in the period from the 1960s on. And I could find, and a friend of mine and I are working on specific concrete statements from people like Mitch Daniels that make precisely that point. With the few minutes I have remaining, I dabbled with the idea of, okay, civic literacy sounds like a good thing. Uh, I assume it would address democracy. And I found a political scientist, a political theorist who wrote about uh, democracy, and he had codified, uh, used metrics to identify uh, from, I don't know, 30 or 40 or 50 different commentators, pundits, as well as academics, on what they mean uh, by democracy. And here are five common definitions of democracy, and I thought it was fun to think about them. One, it is a dangerous form of government, uh, and that's what Mitch Daniels wants to overcome. Two, it includes genuine competition for power. Three, it permits mass participation on a legally equal footing. Four, it provides civil, civil and other liberties that restrict the sphere of state power within the society. Or five, it promotes widespread deliberation about how to make and enforce policy so as to promote the common good. I made up a list of my own. And I think this list I was thinking of Purdue all the time. Would a civic literacy program address power? Who has it? And how do individuals get it? Would a civic literacy program address the connection between money and power? Would a civic literacy program uh, address the complicated question about whether having a two-party system constitutes in and of itself democracy? Would it address how our policies uh, made? And what about interest groups and gerrymandering and the role of the electoral college in the court system? I think these are all interesting and important uh, questions. And some of the civic literacy um, uh, requirement that has come down to uh, Purdue involves the possibility of taking an introductory course in American politics or American history. And it's possible that some of these questions will be addressed in those courses. But I would argue, and this is just my bias, that these are not the kind of questions that uh, Mitch Daniels and the Board of Trustees are interested in students uh, addressing. Historicizing all of this. Well, you've got Limbaugh, you've got ACTA, the Koch Foundation, um, the fact that maybe 40% now uh, of uh, presidents of universities come from the corporate world, um, the significant decline, you know, of those coming from the educational um, arena. Um, there's a growing resistance to what I call correct uh, contested terrain. Uh, I might briefly mention when Daniels was still governor and Howard Zinn died, some enterprising reporter found an email that for Mitch Daniels to someone else that said, uh, I'm glad he's dead. And uh, Daniels tried to limit the use of a people's history of the United States in uh, educational courses. And of course, much more recently, the whole effort to, um, uh, to not, uh, not grant full professorship to Nicole Hannah-Jones by political pressure groups in, at the near the University of North Carolina because of her role in uh, establishing the 1619 Project, a serious reconsideration of the causes and impacts of, um, uh, of uh, slavery in American society. Uh, in addition, there have been efforts ever since the 60s by uh, people from ACT and others to marginalize liberal arts and to challenge these programs that I uh, referred to. And of course, over the last year, would, there's the combination of the rise of the right and right-wing reaction to Black Lives Matter, the labor movement, the peace movement, and the Sanders campaign. 
near the end, here I call it resistances. Uh, what has been going on in the response to uh, the drive for ideological hegemony in higher education? One, there's been a resurgence of the American Association of University Pre Professors, longtime organization initiated by John Dewey. And in some university or college settings, AUP is a bargaining agent, is a union. And the mantra, the key mantra of AUP is so-called shared governance, that, uh, that rules be um, that the precedent of faculty taking primary responsibility for educational matters at the university be maintained and enhanced. Secondly, there's growing unionization drives on various college campuses, faculty, grad students, staff, and uh, adjuncts. And upwards of 60 to 70% of all college classes now are taught by adjuncts. So uh, these are people who are extremely vulnerable and are less likely to be in the forefront of uh, challenging the ideological hegemony of those who are, uh, who are advocating for a particular uh, civic uh, literacy. Um, meanwhile, um, there's conflict and disagreement over privatization of public universities. There, there's a whole laundry list of changes that have occurred at Purdue over the last five or six years, the privatization of public facilities, the establishment of Purdue Global, the online university that, um, uh, that uh, I referred to, increased reliance on corporate and military funding. And in our own case, Purdue University has collaborated with realtors and local government in West Lafayette to construct much new housing to encourage um, nationwide food chains to come to the community. So there develops a kind of uh, commitment, if you will, to maintain a, um, a high student population on campus so they could uh, be the customers for the goods and services that are e increasingly provided um, by uh, these the new presence of of, of corporations. So, um, uh, so that's a significant part of the story. Uh, so uh, we're at a point in time of struggle, contested terrain versus uh, resistance, uh, resistance to it in the establishment of programs like civic literacy. I have two addendum. See, here's a, a fun uh, critical race theory. Uh, I argue that there are two approaches given this uh, contemporary historical context dealing with the issue of the centrality of race in American society. One, banish the discussion of it in, uh, in colleges and universities and uh, in K through 12, or two, to prevent, uh, present a sanitized version of US history like civic literacy. So in my view, Purdue has uh, uh, provided the, um, you know, is using the latter strategy rather than as we see in some state legislatures to ban the teaching of critical race theory, which they don't really know about except to say, don't discuss race and racism and the role of white supremacy and slavery in American history. Um, things are happening so fast that Purdue, I can't keep up. Um, here are a, 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 an appendix or two that I want to briefly refer to. This first one I'll just briefly refer to, and it's not about Purdue, but uh, there's a wonderful website called Uncoke My Campus, and it was inspired by, uh, uh, by Nancy McLean, who turned on some students at a uh, university to do research on the Koch brothers, and they, is just, they just issued a new report called the Coke Network and the Capture of K-12 Education. And you'll see their tactics, organized tactics to recruit state legislators, to um, get um, uh, citizens to vote for to state legislators who would have a pro Coke brothers agenda, like defunding public education, shifting to charter schools. 
destabilizing state funding in schools to promote policies that divert, the, divert funds away from traditional public schools and so on and so forth. And of course, um, uh, elect candidates to state legislators who would approach, oppose critical race theory. The last um, uh, part of the story, moving a little away from ideological hegemony, but not really so much. Um, actually, not at all, now that I think about it. Within the last week, to briefly mention, the Attorney General of the state of Indiana announced that he would be investigating the Confucius Institute at Valparaiso University. Valparaiso University, which I don't know much about, but I gather is a Lutheran college that has had the Confucius Institute since 2008. And it has a sister university relationship with the university in China. And its primary project is cultural exchanges, music, the arts, history, and so on. And uh, the Attorney General of the state of Indiana has declared, his name is Todd Rokitas, worth remembering his name, has declared that the Confucius Institute and Valparaiso University may be an institutional vehicle for uh, promoting Chinese communism in the state of Indiana. If Chinese communism is interested in promoting itself, Indiana would not be the place where uh, it should begin. Secondly, Purdue President Mitch Daniels, who writes a periodic column in the Washington Post, wrote this week as part of a comparison of the history of the Chinese Communist Party and the, the United, U, United States history, that China is a seventh century theocracy an oligarchic klep kleptocracy and totalitarian autocracy. He criticized the celebration of China's hundred years since the creation of its communist party by saying that everyone from the smallest children to the highest officialdom was invited in quotes to applaud the successes of the past hundred years. It celebrated the centennial in the style at which um, dictatorship specialized. I think that's a good uh, definition of the civic literacy program at Purdue University. And finally, Purdue, Purdue University, and this has been going on for several months, announced recently that its research uh, arm, parallel research arm, Purdue uh, Research Foundation, was establishing the first of a kind U.S. facility to test, quote, hypersonic technology at the Purdue Aerospace District. I didn't know of the Purdue Aerospace District until this week, so it's a new one for me. And Purdue already has a hypersonic allied research facility. One of my projects is to find out what all this is invol uh, uh, involves. And I do know that Purdue University or the PRF, Purdue Research Foundation, uh, already has adjacent to the Purdue campus, a Rolls-Royce facility and its new test facilities will be used to develop high altitude and hybrid electric engines to power the next generation of US military aircraft. And spokespersons from PRF in the past have pointed out that the United States needs to be ready for the new challenges that uh, the demonic uh, People's Republic of China uh, threatens uh, the United States. So there's an interesting confluence between uh, Purdue University as a STEM research institution um, perhaps experiencing uh, financial problems, becoming the site for uh, new research for the next generation of weapon systems uh, to fight against the Chinese in the years ahead. In sum, I wrote this up about uh, this last part. Peru continues to, build, to develop connections with the military industrial con complex and rationales for it are articulated by an op-ed against China written by the university's president of the Washington, in the Washington Post this week. 
Similarly, the Attorney General of the state of Indiana, Todd Rokita, announced this week also that he would be looking into possible influence of Chinese communism at Valparaiso University in Northern Indiana. Is it merely a coincidence that these pronouncements appear at the same time that Purdue announced that a national hypersonic ground test facility will be built in the Purdue uh, Aerospace District? Military giants, Rolls-Royce, I misspelled it here, will figure prominently in this transformation of land adjacent to the Purdue campus. We may be reliving the 1950s, raising the specter of communism while a new militarism escalates the misallocation of valuable societal resources. The last thing I was going to do if I had the technical um, uh, facility was, um, uh, was to play Pete Singer uh, singing, What Did You Learn in School Today? But I figure I'd give up rather than accidentally deleting this whole slide set. Uh, but think of the uh, word. Harry, you can do that. Sorry to interrupt. You can do that if you like. You just have to bring that on your screen and then make a, uh, you know, you just go a different, you end this and get that on the screen, just like you did. You will not erase these slides. That would not be erased, just. Yeah, I think I've probably exceeded by a minute or two my time, but most of you remember the song and it's fun to look at. You could revisit it on YouTube. Uh, yeah, but what we what we learn in school today, uh, the people who support civic literacy uh, would want to be uh, American exceptionalism. And that's what the lyrics of that song written by Tom Paxson refers to. So how about if I stop here and what we could take a break and talk? Okay. Is that all right, Raj and Eugene? Yeah, that's, that's fine. Gene, it's Gene in control. Gene. Okay. Well, uh, let me get back on. Can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. Okay, yes. great. Well, well, thanks so much, uh, Harry. They've certainly uh, given us a lot to think about and to uh, discuss. And so I wanna give people a little chance to organize their thoughts and make a few announcements about our upcoming programs. Uh, next week, uh, as you know, there are some issues going on in Cuba. And we have invited uh, uh, excellent talk, uh, what the hell is going on in Cuba these days? And we have asked Tony Ryan to organize a discussion of that topic. And you can find out more on our website. Following that, uh, we have a session on, is the US global empire actually in decline? And uh, uh, Stanfield Smith and our own um, uh, uh, Roger Harris will give us that program. So, we, and we have some more things coming up we're still not sure on. But uh, those are the things we're having uh, coming up. And so all these are listed on our webpage, icssmarks.org. Um, and also, uh, I'll remind everybody that we are a working class grassroots organization, and we do not accept funds uh, from the Soros Foundation or the Koch brothers, <laughs> even were they to offer them to us, which they haven't so far. But so if we do rely on uh, our comrades, uh, such as yourselves, and Richard, um, did you want to, or, or are you going to say something about that? Um, yeah, I, will, I could say uh, just a few words. Um, I posted on the, the webs on the chat, as I usually do, some information on how you can contribute financially to ICSS. And I certainly urge anybody who has a little extra cash to do that. Uh, there are a number of ways, the old fashioned way, sending, sending a check. Um, but um, also some new, more efficient ways like uh, PayPal or Patreon. Patreon, you can give a regular contribution um, and that'll, any one of those methods will be appreciated. So um, thank you on, on that and I'll return to Jean. 
Oh, okay, well, I'm interested in this concept, uh, a little extra cash. I don't know if we want to go into that or not, but uh, again, th thank you. Okay, now we're going to switch over to our uh, questions, answers, responses. Uh, we'll uh, ask everybody to limit their discussion or questions uh, to two minutes, and uh, we'll give uh, Harry a chance to respond to each of them. Um, and I will keep a stack and uh, just so um, best way to do is to raise your hand. I see Anne has her hand raised already, um, but I will do my best to do keep that stack. And if somebody else could watch the chat, um, that would be uh, assistance. Um, but just to get that started, I just want to say that uh, Everything Harry says rings true. I've spent my whole life in academia also. And just two little comments that stick in my mind. Uh, one of the things that uh, the president of Harvard University uh, is alleged to have said that we do not have a problem with academic freedom. We are careful who we hire. So that kind of uh, <laughs> says something about the state of higher education. So anyway, I will... Uh, begin our stack and our first commenter is uh, Ann Lewis. Hi, Harry. Um, thank you so much. It, a lot of this rings true for me. I'm, I work as a, um, high, a very um, fancily titled adjunct at the University of Texas at Austin. And I think that what I'm seeing is uh, right now is a couple of things that are very contradictory. Um, one of them is um, we are now in a position at the University of Texas at Austin of, first of all, being forced to allow unvaccinated, unmasked um, students in our classrooms, also armed students in our classrooms um, from before. And this is being forced by the state of Texas and by our Board of Regents, which is highly corporatized and appointed by the governor. Um, so the question is, how do you fight this? And there's the faculty council has said, oh, we need to have shared governance, but we have no mechanism for demanding that. Um, we have a union. The union is a, an industrial style union um, in the sense that it includes staff, um, grad workers, faculty, and adjuncts. Um, hmm. That gives us across the state, um, include uh, any public worker in Texas, we're CWA union. Um, we have not been very successful in organizing faculty in particular, because faculty is very individualized and competitive. Adjuncts are very much at risk. Um, our basis of, of organization has always been in the grad workers and in the, um, and in the um, staff. And so we have a contradiction in terms of ideology and really pushing um, for things like critical race theory on campus and for a, a, a more open for defense of the various centers that have been formed over the years, which need defense at this point really badly. Um, and for our, our freedom of speech as, as people that work in academia. The other thing that's been cropping up is that we find ourselves fighting for things that are really bad educational models, like the right to teach online under COVID. Um, so all of a sudden, here we are demanding teaching online, which is horrible academic practice, um, terrible for students and terrible for faculty, um, involves wage theft among other things for faculty. Um, and, and here we are demanding that as union people in the university. So I feel like we're so thoroughly screwed that I <laughs> kind of just wanted to express how much, how important these things are and how limited our efforts seem to be in, the, in, in confronting what is really a crisis um, in Texas. And we are currently in terms of COVID in a horrible, horrible place in Austin. Okay. Well, th th thank you, Anne. That's very useful. And 
Uh, we have Norman coming up, but Harry, did you want to comment on this? Uh, I really appreciate uh, Anne's uh, comments, and I'm sensitive to the fact that there are uh, some differences in different locations, but uh, my experience of Purdue is very similar to, uh, to hers. Uh, we jump-started an AUP chapter, which back in the day in the 70s had over 200 people and it had dwindled to a half dozen. And uh, within the last two years, it's gone up to about 80. There's a lot of concentration on the issue of shared governance and an interest, interest in making this university senate, which has no real authority, uh, have, uh, have more influence. But the larger number of faculty, um, I, I think are very individualistic, uh, have the feeling that they can uh, get more of what they want by acting on their own. And uh, back in the day, in the 80s, a few of us started an AFT local on campus. And uh, it was a particularly a problem to, uh, to get any interest, even though some faculty said, I'd, I'm glad you've established the AFT local, but of course I would never join. So uh, that is uh, an enduring problem. The problem of online is, is so uh, complicated and contradictory uh, as well. Um, Indiana University, the other public institution in the state, has mandated that uh, every student and all staff uh, will, will be vaccinated, and Purdue University has not taken that step. Uh, paradoxically, they say uh, people who are not va vaccinated may be subject uh, randomly to COVID tests, which seems to be more of an imposition against freedom than uh, having everybody be tested. And so you have this uh, situation where faculty with trepidation are going to be going into the classroom and at least the online would be a little more healthy for them. And Mitch Daniels at some point a few months ago was uh, pridefully saying that Purdue uh, licked the COVID, uh, the COVID problem and we have to take risks. So there's a really a kind of I don't know, machismo, and I, I agree with Ann that we're, we're caught in the paradox of not really being comfortable with online education, but finding it as perhaps one of the few ways to protect the health uh, of faculty and students. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Harry. Now we have uh, Norma Harrison and Rich Johnson uh, coming up. Norma, go ahead. Um, yeah, hi, everybody. Uh, the uh, situation is not going to be addressed until people start to wonder, well, why do we have to be separated by age? The uh, event of learning goes on all our lives. Uh, uh, teachering has been put in the position of officiating over learning uh, to the detriment of that people do it all the time and it is not respected or considered. <clears throat> um, the idea that children have to be separated from us and not only separated, but separated by age has to be, it, we have to complain about it. For me, it was agony to be separated from my child when he was little. I, in fact, I stayed home for seven years. I did not take an outside job except maybe for a couple hours a week because it, it wrenched my heart out. <laughs> the idea that we, we were forced to be separated. Uh, and I hope people stop, start asking themselves about that. Uh, I've posted a number of deeply important comments. You know, I run for a uh, school board every couple of years, uh, deeply important comments in the chat talking about these couple of things like that school teachering is a jobs program. <laughs> People don't, so don't grow up genetically being able to be a teacher. 
uh, just that they don't grow up genetically being a criminal or a, an engineer, you know, it's just people choose these things and we have to take them and uh, authorize them in those various positions, which could be a good thing and it could be not a good thing. Uh, <laughs> I hope you look at my, uh, at my notes in the chat because uh, they're, they're very carefully worked out descriptions of what we need to do. We need to authorize ourselves to formulate being together in ways that feel good to do and that are protective of earth and uh, all the other benefits that we know we want that we are denied by the present structure of our lives in service to our owners. That's almost three minutes, Norma. Can you wrap it up? One line, people don't know that we have owners. We are on their plantation. Okay, so let's let's move on. And Harry, do you have comments on that? Um, the, the one thing that brought to mind, I totally uh, agreed with Norma. I started teaching in the late 60s, and I, I suspect many of us uh, uh, on this call were of that generation. And I had the opportunity of teaching a, call, a course called Contemporary Political Problems, which means I could do anything I wanted. Uh, this was back in the day. And I got interested. There were the people that interested me and in what I wanted my students to read were people like Paul Goodman, Ivan Illich. I even, I even uh, did a course on utopian socialist. And I realized if you read Owen and Fourier, organizing education was a central feature of their visions of a different society. And of course, people were taken by Paulo Freire. And so this idea that education should be revisited and reconceptualized, I think is terribly important. Of course, we're not in a position to do that today politically. And obviously the Mitch Daniels of the world would find this kind of sentiment abhorrent to their idea. And when they talk about whether it's expanding online education, uh, dramatically increasing admissions of students. They're trying to train students in a very narrow way uh, in STEM fields to allegedly get jobs. And some of the data indicates that a lot of this STEM, train, STEM training does not lead to jobs. And so, you know, I agree with, I think the impulse of what Arm is saying is that we need to reconceptualize what education means. And I think that's a threat to, to, to all the bad people I've been talking about. Okay, thank you, Harry. Now we have Rich Johnson and uh, no other hands, but I will put myself on the stack after Rich. So- uh, And Gene, Rich, could you, this is Raj, could you also put me on the stack, please? Okay, I'll put you on the stack before me if that's okay. That's okay. Okay. Yes. Uh, hi, this is Kit again. Um, anyway, this is my first time to hear you, uh, Harry, and I really appreciate everything you have to say. Um, I'm really learning a lot here, um, uh, but it also confirms what I already do know. Um, and also, I'm curious, are you related to Russell Targ? Um, well, you reminded me of my education in history, and I've had anxiety dreams related to not doing my homework in history and other classes, and um, you know, have dreamed of failing my exams in, the, in this situation. Um, however, I did well in my community college in history because the only requirement was to read the book, but not talk or discuss it in class. So... Um, Anyway, um, I was supposed to do a paper in college as well on brainwashing in, um, mm -hmm. well, this was at the university level. I never finished it, but I did read books on media and how it influences, um, influences our, uh, our um, you know, what we buy and what we think and all that. Um, I've worked in uh, marketing, advertising, and media before, so I understand this influence pretty well. Um, not maybe not as well as you do because of all your readings. Um, I also work with students at the uh, county government where we uh, have students come in and learn about 
uh, working in government. And frankly, I think <laughs> they're learning that it's boring. Um, but I, I work in an office that's not that, to me, not that exciting. We deal with taxes um, or assessing properties for taxes, I should say. Um, so anyway, there isn't, in terms of uh, the Chinese threat, uh, what's getting mixed in with this, uh, and I don't know if you've been reading on this subject, but it, it has to do with uh, U.S. military seeing UFOs as a threat. Um, and they think that the Chinese are also involved in this because um, China has its probe on Mars right now, and the U.S. obviously sees this as a competition um, for the space race. Um, but, uh, you know, the U.S. military and the government are calling on Congress to support more, mili- more funding for accelerating militarization in space. So anyway, that's when you talked about what's going on with Purdue. I thought about that, and I wonder what your comments are on that. Okay, thank you. Harry? Yes, um, Russell Targer's a cousin. Uh, <laughs> I shouldn't say any more in, uh, in, in public. Oh. Russell Targer's a cousin. Committees of Correspondence has just produced a new, very interesting reader called the China Reader. And it's a collection of about, what, 15 or 20 articles. Gary has uh, a piece in it on uh, analyzing China and uh, U.S.-Chinese relations. I'm very much impressed with uh, Alfred McCoy's book, The the Shape of the uh, Declining Empire. And the central thesis of his book is that in terms of traditional metrics about empires like uh, economic dominance, military dominance, cultural dominance, the United States is declining compared with China, particularly economically. And McCoy's argument is that the US has decided to try and overcome this declining relative uh, power uh, through the development of a new generation of military weapons uh, to be able to threaten and defeat a China. And, and he makes a powerful case with a lot of specific information on uh, military technology. Vijay Prajad, who's wonderful and is all over YouTube uh, and the internet, has made similar, similar points. And he argues that the predominant threat from the vantage point of Washington of China is Chinese scientific and technological development. And um, I saw Prashad lecture a week or two ago where he argues that the dominant motivation of American foreign policy has been historically what he calls predominance. That is to be able to dominate the, uh, the international, uh, international system. And he says Washington perceived China as a threat to that in terms of economics and scientific and technological development. And it was interesting to me to see that maybe two or three years ago, uh, university spokespersons uh, began to talk about these new contracts they were, uh, they were agreeing to with Rolls Royce, with the um, Department of Defense and some of their agencies using as the rationale, the Chinese threat. And, you know, talk about ideological hegemony. I think you're right. China's become the new Soviet Union, the new international communist threat, and it greases the wheels for an enormous, um, uh, unfortunate military expenditures. Thank you. Thank you. And now, uh, let's see, we have uh, Raj and then Richard W. M. Keg. Um, and uh, then I'll go also, Gene. So that, so Raj. Uh, uh, Gene, I think uh, Rick Johnson is ahead of me. Uh, but No, that was, was that not Kit? Uh, oh, okay. Kit has already spoken. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so you're, you're right. Thank you. Thank you for taking me, me alert on that, though. Okay, all right. I don't know if Rich wants to go back on, but uh, right now we have you, Raj. Okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> So Harry, thank you take very my much hand for, up. for this very informative presentation. Uh, the question you started by talking about uh, 
ideology becoming a material force and, and Gramsci, you quoted Gramsci. And I think that is, I agree with that. And some of the concepts, you know, I just, I'm not from academia, so I won't be able to talk much about what is going on in the academic field and, and freedom to teach. Uh, but I see certain concepts that were uh, associated with capitalism have become accepted uh, even within the Marxist, those who propose overthrow of capitalism. For example, the idea of development. Now development is a generalized concept, which means something that was not good enough. It means you were behind, you improve the material condition of life and, in, and educational and all the other conditions of life so pe more people can benefit. Now that has become synonymous with development of the middle class. So for example, uh, if capitalist mechanism in a socialist country develops uh, six or 800 million people or 30% of the population out of absolute poverty into livable condition, then you justify it as, as okay. And um, because the, then the path is not questioned, which inevitably creates the lopsided structure in society and creates forces of capital that then have their own control over that, even the society governed presumably by uh, communists. I don't think, uh, so this idea of ideology of capitalism adopted into socialism, and one, uh, one other concept, and then let you, I would like you to respond, is that of consumerism. Uh, so development has become synonymous with consumerism. So these three things, development, development of middle class with a subsection and consumerism, I like your comment because if you want to advance an alternative ideology, which is a communist ideology, can these be accepted uh, any in academia and outside and still fight uh, capitalism? That's my question to you. Thank you, Raj. So, Harry. Uh, that's a <laughs> complicated question. And um, I think my, my answer might be uh, inadequate. There is, as you know, extensive debate on the left about whether China is socialist or not. There is some debate in, about Cuba and Vietnam. Um, I am convinced by people like Vija Prashad and a number of others who say that China's development over the last 20 or 30 years has used capitalist instrumentalities, even uh, making China attractive for foreign investors. And the end result, and these points out, for example, that one of the major um, demands that uh, the Chinese government made was that foreign investors should uh, provide a knowledge of the science and technology that they were bringing to the manufacturing facilities that they were establishing in China. And Vijay Prashad points out that contrary to the whole history of capitalist countries penetrating, invading, expropriating um, resources from poor countries is that in the main, they didn't leave any footprint of science and technology, any expertise that in fact would allow for the development of these countries. And Vijay Prashad argues that to the contrary, uh, China did um, uh, demand these resources and China did uh, use them for purposes of economic development, development in science and technology and so on. And the result, as Raj pointed out, was that about 700 million people in China have been uh, brought out of poverty. Uh, we made a trip several years ago to Vietnam and there was debate about Doi Moi, 
introducing markets in Vietnam. And one of the briefers, one of the presumably uh, government spokespersons, said that since Doi Moi was established, a kind of market socialism or socialism with Vietnamese characteristics in the 1980s, uh, people living under their poverty rate declined from 60% to below 20%. And so from my point of view, these are terribly important developments. And as outsiders, uh, I, I am interested in observing what happens next and the extent to which um, public institutions control uh, capitalist developments inside presumably uh, socialist countries. The same agonizing discussion is going on in reference to Cuba and should Cuba open up to markets uh, uh, and so on and so forth. So I think this is ongoing, problematic, the outcome of the, uh, two possible outcomes that capitalist forces will undermine the socialist vision or socialist institutions will survive and grow using those features of capitalism that might facilitate industrialization and development. And finally, the bottom line, you know, I come down strongly on this, is that it's not for uh, US progressives to pass judgment on what the Chinese or the Vietnamese or the Cubans are doing. So, you know, but I know this, this is a big debate on the left and I've sat in on many meetings where, where these issues are, are discussed and agonizingly so in the simplistic form, is China socialist or capitalist and so on. So I appreciate the question. I'm sorry for the inadequacy of the answer. Thank you, Harry. Um, and then we'll move forward to uh, Richard W. M. Keg, and then Jean, and then Richard Fallenbaum. Uh, Hi, there. Hi there, Harry. We, we see each other face to face this time. Yes. Your <laughs> <laughs> uh, background keeps changing. I know it. <laughs> well, they asked me, hey, anyways. Uh, this this matter this, uh, this paraphrase kept going through my head that to a university professor everything looks like a, a university. Um, and I don't mean to offend you at all, but but um, but in point of fact, uh, a lot of your stuff is addressed toward uh, basically you know the top twenty. Well, I say the top, but if it, the twenty percent of people that go to universities. It looks like there's going to be substantial amounts of money being spent on vocational education. And my question is, uh, in light of this whole, you know, our, our, the dictum of, of, of the, uh, the point of history is to change it. How do we address these? Where, how, where, what hook do we use to get outside the universities and into vocational schools? Uh, and not necessarily exclusively. Uh, thank you. Uh, go ahead, Harry. Okay. I think that's a great point to raise. And once again, uh, Indiana and Purdue uh, generate some of the questions of, of this nature. We have a system called the Ivy Tech system. Uh, I think th it's similar to junior colleges. And um, other states have junior colleges. And some of these uh, junior colleges have very flexible hours. So people who work during the day can take courses at night. I think the whole trust of uh, the Purdue example, Mitch Daniels and the board of trustees is to ignore this state system of uh, accessible, affordable public education and um, state legislative investments in the Ivy Tech system had declined. I think you're right. There are any number of venues that could provide uh, fl flexible opportunities for so-called non-traditional students to learn skills. I'd be interested in learning more. I gather I used to be a delegate to our local labor council and uh, the Carpenters uh, Apprenticeship Program looked to me like very good education 
for uh, training young people who want to who want to do those kind of skills and get jobs uh, in in that area. So I think you're right. I think we ought to expand what we mean by institutions uh, promoting um, promoting education. Now, one other thing to add, and I regard it as a negative that I didn't get a chance to get into, is that Purdue University, through its College of Technology, has established a handful of technical high schools around the state of Indiana. And the idea is that the young people, it is claimed people from uh, underprivileged areas, will get high school training, and if they graduate, they can go to Purdue. And so you have uh, new high schools in Indianapolis, South Bend, and three or four other places around the state. As I understand it, there's virtually no participation in decision-making by the teachers union, by members of the community, that these new high schools are a different way to get at the charter school phenomena that excludes the public from having input, any kind of input. And I have the vision, at least, of Mitch Daniels and Purdue as recreating an educational system dominated by uh, Purdue University. Now, whether that extreme is, whether I'm exaggerating the danger whether similar circumstances are going on in other states, uh, I'm not sure. But I totally agree that there ought to be a number of ways in which uh, people can pursue education and does, it re and does this education require a particular kind of degree uh, or should it be based upon some sub substantive learning that could have some use value to the working people who t take these courses? You know, I do think these are terribly important questions. And from my point of view, the vision of the Koch brothers, descendants of Clark Kerr, um, there's another person we're exploring, the president of Arizona State, Michael Crow, who I gather has written about his vision of a 20th, 21st century university. All of these have a narrow, technocratic, schematic, metric driven conception of what education is. And I think that needs to be challenged uh, in a whole variety of ways. Okay, thank you, Harry. And then we'll switch to M. Keg, and maybe you want to uh, give, you, give us your- That's Mike, Gil That's Mike Gilbert, Mike Gilbert. Mike Gilbert, okay. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks very much indeed. Really interesting uh, presentation. Um, I just want to make a couple of points and, and, and ask a question, I, I think. Um, firstly, when I, when I studied Marxism um, back in the early 1980s, um, my, one of the understandings that I had of, um, the ca of a capitalist system was that it in, engages in capital accumulation. Um, and within, in the absence of that, then, you know, you, you really don't have a, a, a capitalist system at all, which to me suggests that um, the, the situation in, in China is that you have a state uh, capitalist system because the surplus value created by the working classes in China um, is being acquired by the Communist Party state. Um, so uh, for me, the, the whole notion of, of, of China being socialist uh, is, is probably accurate because the money, the surplus value is spent on the people of China to a large extent. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, um, as, a, as a communist country, it, it, fall, it falls very far short of that because it's still a country that's engaged in capital accumulation. Count, uh, the counterpoint to that is that Western societies, and that includes the, the UK, have moved to a position now where we're not really creating a great deal of capital. The way we're maintaining our society is on the back of huge amounts of debt. And we've been acquiring and accumulating more and more debt, all of which is burdens the working people because this liability isn't owned by the thing called the, gov the government. It's actually owned by the nation state and therefore it's owned by the people. So there's a, so there's a sense in which capitalism is in crisis. Um, and what I've 
what I see is I see all the, in, the institutions of the state um, fighting to try and maintain um, the, the state as it were um, in the heyday of, of, of capitalism's actual hegemony. I mean, I'm talking here, you know, 50, 60, 70, uh, uh, or up to 100, 200 years ago, when the bourgeois state was absolutely thriving um, and was able to operate in the way that we typically assume and associate bourgeois states with operating. So, you know, for me, I think that the, the time is ripe for us to see a, a, a complete change. I mean, there's been references to education throughout. And, and also the, the, one of the commentators said she was very much saddened by the fact that she couldn't spend time with her son um, when, um, when she was in work. All of these things are now capable of being corrected, in my opinion. But what we have to deal with first is our 18th century political systems holding back this um, tide of progress. Voter apathy, to me, is an indication that the public are aware that this system is broken um, and they just need some people or some way of articulating what actually needs to change. Um, so um, I, I just think that education is part of it, uh, a, a very major part of it. But the challenge has to be, I think, and I'd, I'd hope you'd agree, uh, challenging our politicians and, and, and demanding changes to our political system that reflect the changes that have already occurred within our, our economies. Hey, Harry. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, my frustration, I'm sure it's all of ours, is uh, how to get the job done, how to organize. Um, I'm encouraged by uh, the rise of progressive forces in the United States. Um, I was encouraged by the Sanders campaign. I'm encouraged by uh, the dramatic increase in the number of young people engaged in politics, many of whom are happy to declare that they are socialists. But I'm frustrated by what someone around here where I live calls the silo effect. We're still not organized together. There are multiplicity right. of organizations, often single issue organizations. So my friends who are worried about Purdue University join AUP, but you can't get them to think about a single single payer healthcare or any other such things, although they might passively agree it's a good idea. And so I, I totally agree with, uh, with the analysis, the fact that capitalism is in crisis. And of course, we haven't even mentioned the environmental part of capitalism in crisis. Uh, how the hell do we get organized to bring about the fundamental change that's needed? And that for that, you have to get another speaker. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. And uh, so it's my turn. And then we have Richard Fallenbaum and Gary Hicks, I believe. But let me just uh, um, uh, start here. Um, as an anthropologist, I, I just wanted to throw in an anthropological perspective. Uh, one of my professors was Leslie White. I don't know if you know him. He was a Marxist uh, anthropologist who I took his class at UC Berkeley as an undergraduate. But he said that uh, he actually as an anthropologist, he ends with the rise of civilization. But he says with the rise of what we call civilization and the state, uh, and ruling classes, then new mechanisms of social control are needed. And he says these constitute what he calls the, the state church, twin agencies of social control in civilized societies, uh, uh, which call themselves civilized. But at any rate, uh, he, and he quotes the Catholic church, theoreticians associated with the Catholic church that say, uh, God has divided the government of the human race into two authorities, ecclesiastical and civil, establishing one over things uh, civil, the other over things divine. And if the rulers of people disdain the authority of God, the people in turn despise the authority of men. There remains, it is true, the usual expedient of using uh, violence to enforce uh, your rule, but violence subdues the, the bodies of men, not their souls. 
And the implication is quite clear that if you want to subdue the human soul, you need something like the church to get inside people's minds. And of course, he doesn't consider modern civilization, uh, bourgeois civilization, but I think this is still true. Um, and I, I think someone quoted uh, another Pope to me that said, give me a child to age five and I will have him for life. Mm -hmm. So I just want to know if you have any comments on the continuing role of uh, religion in uh, thought control here in our societies. Thank you. Oh, okay. Um, that much wisdom. I've always been, or I, I was excited about the emergence of the Moral Mondays campaign. And we tried in Indiana to build a Moral Mondays movement and it worked for a while. Uh, we peaked early. We invited Reverend Barber to speak in the steps of the uh, in, uh, Indiana Assembly Building. And for various reasons, our group deconstructed over the next several months. Uh, I've been impressed also more recently, the new Poor People's Campaign. And um, I accede to the fact, while I don't prioritize religion in my own life, I uh, acceded to uh, Reverend Barber's uh, connecting re religiosity or some kind of spirituality to the material needs of people. And I think if we're going to overcome our silos, perhaps a movement like the New Poor People's Campaign is the way to go. But having said that, I hear different things from about the level of success or not of the New Poor People's Campaign uh, in various states around the country. Uh, but I, I had regarded it as a very positive development. Okay, well, thank you. Next, we have uh, Richard Fallenbaum, followed by Gary Hicks. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I appreciate your uh, presentation also. Harry, and um, uh, I was uh, triggered by your mention of Clark Kerr and the multiversity because I go back to that day when, when it came out and I was a student, undergraduate student at Berkeley at the time. Uh, and uh, Clark Kerr was interestingly, was considered a, a liberal and, and considered himself a liberal and a progressive even, even a radical. And he was, uh, I don't know, radical perhaps, but you know, it's it it seems like people put on different clothing, you know, depending on the time, and um, just just an observation. But also another one is that um, uh, this period of contestation, ideological contestation, in in um, higher education, was sort of an anomalous period sort of along mm. the post-war period. The mm -hmm. period before, it was the, they're re-establishing hegemony or mm -hmm. attempting to that um, existed all, you know, from the establishment of Harvard right until the end of World War II. And um, so I wonder if you get any feel, and it looks like they're, to some extent, they're succeeding in re-establishing. How will, how, how, will, how will Marxists deal with that? How, what, are the, what thoughts do you have on, you know, when the, the, do, do, how we function in the, in the 20s and 30s, give, give, give suggestions on how we could uh, conduct the str intellectual st struggle uh, in the cu current period? Oh, wow, it's very difficult. Harry. Yeah, I, I've gotten, since I've gotten very interested in this subject, and I discovered this week um, in Wikipedia, if you forgive me, uh, an entry called Critical University Studies. And apparently there's a, a group um, of academics who have critiques similar to the ones that I raised. And one who is dense for me to read is from UC Santa Barbara, Christopher... Um, Newfield, and uh, he's written a lot on, on these kind of questions, but I'm getting interested in revisiting the history. I know that 
there was a transformation of higher education um, uh, in the eight, between the 1890s and 1910 in the direction of education for producing workers, literate workers to work in the factories. There's a wonderful book uh, by Clyde Barrow, a political scientist called Universities in the Capitalist uh, State, which analyzes boards of trustees in major, mostly prestigious universities from the 1880s to the 1920s, largely dominated by corporate interests. Um, I remember reading an article by the old David Horowitz before he went crazy on the uh, in Ramparts, where we described the uh, effort to establish uh, Soviet study institutes at prestigious universities to turn out academics who will then permeate higher education and uh, educate young people in uh, uh, all the horrors of, of the Soviet Union and communism. And I think it's true that the 60s was an anomaly. I'm reading some old essays, friend Carl who was a SDS activist in the 60s. And uh, there, were, there were a number of articles criticizing curricula, uh, criticizing who determined what the substance of higher education uh, could be. And again, the outcome, even at Purdue University, was uh, African-American studies program, women's studies, peace studies, and so on. And these programs continued and expanded and were popular for the next 20 years. And I really see Limbaugh's comment and Mitch Daniels perspective and uh, Alec and the Koch brothers as seeking to overcome, push back and eliminate this, uh, uh, this new, this vibrant expansion of ideological discussion and debate. And I think where we're at now is we have to defend it. And those of us who are involved uh, in higher education have to defend uh, African American studies for being eliminated. You know, I think we're at that stage at, at many universities. And what happened to the woman at North Carolina, um, the, uh, the, the hoopla around critical race theory, I think are all attempts that would lead from the perspective of uh, of the corporate class to in their in their in their best dreams to the elimination of these programs in this curricula, and I think from our side, and I speak as a member of just one group, committees of correspondence for democracy and socialism, there hasn't been enough attention paid to higher education and or K through twelve, and it's sort of ironic to me that many of the people in CCDS and similar organizations in the 60s and 70s were engaging in campus struggles over who's gonna teach and what's going to be taught. And I think we've dropped the ball on that. We don't pay enough attention to higher education. So that would be you know, my immediate call for us to, those of us who are involved in education at all levels and all kinds of institutions, to, uh, to remobilize ourselves and project a progressive agenda that not only affects, protects the workers in these institutions, but offers alternative substi uh, substance to uh, curricular development. Okay. And Lewis just posted about labor studies. There was a wonderful labor studies program in, in Indiana, Indiana University. And I kind of met up with several of them and um, went to several of their classes. And I was just blown away that they used the concept of class as often as we breathe air. And I, wow, I hardly ever used the word class in my political science courses. And labor studies were, was really a vibrant program. It, uh, it offered opportunities for, uh, for non-traditional students some of my friends in labor studies uh, took their uh, PowerPoints and their machines, uh, their overhead machines and drove to union halls and taught courses there. It was a wonderful model. 
but it was dependent upon a state legislature then controlled by Democrats to fund the program. And when the Indiana legislature went Republican, uh, labor studies was destroyed. But labor studies was a great example around the country of a way to offer progressive and useful education, particularly to non-traditional students. Thanks. Okay, uh, thank you. Gary, uh, you are up. I don't have much to say, actually. Um, <laughs> that's a surprise, Gary. <laughs> yeah, that's true, it's true. I mean, primarily Harry said it all in, in, in some very real respects. I just want to point out a couple of things. On this last point about, this, about the uh, programs at Bloomington, Indiana, one of these days, if you get a chance, Harry, if you haven't done it already, you need to you need to study the period between the mid 1950s and say the mid 1970s, which begin with university with Bloomington being a a sport a, a solid fortress of anti communism and anti Sovietism. It ends in 1971-72 with the, um, you know, with the election of student government led by the Black Panther Party. Mm -hmm. There's a there's a whole lot of stuff that happens in between. You might want to take a look at that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. The other thing I the other the other point I wanted to make is, um. There's been a discussion, I forget who, who raised it, but the whole thing around bourgeois ideology, that we have bourgeois ideology and proletarian or working class ideology. I hate to be a historical nitpicker, but originally ideology was the property of the ruling class. And later on, we got things like proletarian ideology and working class ideology and it never was clear about what these meant but we were very clear about what bourgeois ideology meant it meant that they they ruled and they controlled without thinking um aside from that harry great great show we'll talk again later this week about other great. things great thanks a lot gary Okay. Yeah, be well. Thank you, Gary. And uh, I think what I'd like to do is uh, we're kind of at the end of people who have not yet spoken. So what I'd like to do is give Harry about five minutes or more to kind of summarize this discussion uh, yeah. and give us his final thoughts. And then we will end the formal portion of the discussion and go to uh, informal discussion. We'll keep our stack, which has Norma M. Uh, Gilbert, I think, and uh, uh, Richard W. But first, we'll have uh, Harry's uh, summary of all this uh, all in right. five minutes or so, uh, and then we will end the formal portion of our discussion. So, Harry, your final yeah. words of wisdom. Okay. First, thank you all for your patience and really interesting questions and comments, and I appreciate being invited. I'd prefer uh, to a summary doing something that is, um, is more characteristic of a capitalist society, that is a commercial. Um, uh, CCDS has published this new book, uh, The China Reader, and the editor is Duncan McFarland, who spent a lot of time in China and China Solidarity work and there are essays in that volume by Gary and myself and a number of other folks and that you could go to Changemaker Press and find out information about how to purchase uh, that book. Secondly, I'm an addicted blogger and I have a blog called Heartland Radical. So you could go WW Heartland Radical uh, dot blogspot.com, I believe, and uh, read more than you ever would want to. Um, and third, someone turned me on to an electronic website on higher education globally 
called World University News. And I have an app for it and periodically read these articles that discuss uh, higher education all across the face of the globe. And uh, only about, say, 10% of the articles deal with the United States. And I found it really eye-opening uh, to read that there were similar problems that we face in the U.S., uh, in Northern Europe, in Great Britain. There were changes in enrollment patterns all across the globe, increases in student enrollment in college and universities in Asia, particularly in China, uh, declines in the United States and Western Europe, uh, problems uh, that I experienced at Purdue shifting more in the direction of STEM and away from liberal arts um, in Northern Europe, as well as the United States, issues of state funding for higher education. So uh, I, you know, reading some of the articles in this webpage, I realized that uh, higher education is a worldwide phenomena as well. And it's interesting to think about the connections between uh, different parts of the world and the problems we face. And maybe part of the crisis of global capitalism is a crisis of uh, public education on a worldwide basis. So again, thank you all. And I really enjoyed it. Well, thank you, Harry. And if we look at, I think we could all applaud. That was really an excellent d discussion and stimulate uh, great things from the rest of us. So thank you. And at we this will- At point, I'm going to stop recording, Gene, with your permission. Uh, well, y yes, I think that's probably a good idea, or you could continue to reward and we'll edit the rest of okay. it. Okay, we'll continue. We never, do, we never record, never edit what the our speaker has to say. We give that verbatim. And sometimes things worthwhile are said in the following discussion. So it's up to oh, you. I leave it on. I leave, the it on. leave it on. Okay. Uh, okay, we'll leave it on, but it will end suddenly at, uh, at uh, one o'clock. But I will keep to the to the stack and try to moderate the in, uh, ongoing discussion. And I believe uh, Norma is next, M. Gilbert, and then Richard W. So try to uh, restrain yourself and keep it to our two or three minutes. So go ahead, Norma. <laughs> um, yeah, ideology is what people tell us oh, you're an ideologist or you're an ideologue. It's become an insult in case you wanted to know the following the line. <clears throat> you say it started out with the owning class, but uh, I've had it hurled at me um, for, for saying the, the things that I say. Uh, there's no greater concern about capitalism than China. China knows what's going on <laughs> and they're concerned and they've created a situation where they are able to provide necessities to their mass of people. Uh, and the uh, people who have been making huge profits by practice, uh, by using the capitalist process do not run the country. It's a significant difference. They don't direct program and policy and so forth. They don't control China's actions. Uh, um, that, that's one of the points. I posted a number, you know, I keep on getting impetus from the conversation and I posted one after another um, comments that I want to be sure to share with you. For one thing, there's uh, Pete Seeger singing, what did you learn in school today? About uh, 15, 20 years ago, Berkeley High did a peace program or something like that. And I was, uh, I was with the educators organization, whatever that was. And uh, so I prepared a whole bunch of stuff. I, interview, I interviewed numerous people to come and conduct the kinds of classes on this day that they don't get a chance to conduct in the classroom. And uh, the wrapping for the book 
the little pamphlet that I prepared, a, a multi-page pamphlet, was the song written on the page about what did you learn in school today. <laughs> um, that's only some of the many things that I have to offer you here. Oh yeah, I put up about Nebel and uh, Proctor in case you wanna know what was going on to create the Nebel Proctor Library, who those people were. So, um, okay, that's been three minutes, Norma. Let's uh, right, right, move. right, right, right. Well, let's move forward. Um, everybody has, and somebody said that uh, there's somebody in the waiting room, but I don't know how to admit them. So, if somebody knows how to admit this person, I um, think it's, it's Raj. Uh, could you please do that? Yeah, that would be good. I, I'm chewing gum too, so I, I can't do it. I, I did it. I, I keep it up. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll move <laughs> forward to M. Gilbert. Unmute yourself. Unmute yeah, yourself. That's me again, actually. Yeah, thank you. Um, just a couple of things, really. Really interesting debate. Uh, it's, it's really good to be part of something like this. It doesn't uh, happen that frequently over in the UK that people who identify themselves as Marxists get an opportunity to sort of chat and share ideas. So it's really, really nice to be here. Um, in respect of bourgeois ideology, I mean, I've spent a lot of time trying to make Marxism um, a, a, an attractive ideology, an attractive set of ideas for ordinary working people. Because at the end of the day, if we are going to change things, we need to make Marxism sort of part of a mass movement. We need to encourage people to understand what we understand um, and, and get them to engage with the kind of changes um, and accept the kind of changes that we're, we're keen to promote. Um, and, and so as part of that process, I, I started to kind of deconstruct a lot of what Marx um, and Engels um, were, were, were talking about in their many, many um, very uh, uh, capable and competent works. And I came to the conclusion that essentially their, their, their definition of capitalism falls down to sort of six basic principles. You've got the principles that were created to abandon the feudal system. Um, and those principles are contract, choice and consent. But you've also got the, the vestiges of the feudal system, which, they, which were dragged dialectically uh, into the capitalist model, which is unfairness, elitism and inequality. And I think for ordinary working people, it's really important they understand that as Marxists, we believe in contract choice and consent, as long as it's not used to mask naked exploitation of, of either uh, other people or um, people outside of our own communities. But that what we do believe in is nailing the issues of unfairness, inequality and elitism. And that uh, those three issues are, are, are no more prevalent than in our political systems. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it's the American political system or the UK political system. Fundamentally, you know, we have a big problem in that our political systems are based on parties, that the party system is based on uh, access to positions of power, based on your ability to sort of toe the party line. Um, and so I think, you know, the, the, the mass of working people are ready to hear a message which is going to engage them. Um, and energize them into sort of challenging some of these bourgeois systems that we've inherited from the 18th century. Um, and it's just a case of getting passionate enough to get out there and start trying to persuade them, I guess. Okay, thank you. And, and let me just say um, to Harry, that if you feel like jumping in, uh, please do so. Uh, mm -hmm. But you don't have to make any comments if you don't want to, if you want to leave and take a nap or something else. Uh, feel well, free. eventually I will, but I had three questions. One, I don't know this, the technology. Is it possible to get the stuff in the chat sent around? Yes. As an attack, but, uh, and, Norma, did you want to say something on that? You, you always record it. And uh, if you go down to the chat and open the chat, there's a place where there are three dots down at the bottom right. And if you click on that, you can say, uh, save chat, and you can save the chat. It comes oh. out a bit jarbled, but Norma usually keeps it. Harry, Harry, do you see the chat option sort of at the bottom of your screen? I just put it yeah. yeah. I don't, I, I don't hear you. Yes, I. Uh, okay. 
Yeah. Uh, whatever you post there, and I can run a copy. Yeah. Of and then the I chat. have two other questions. I wonder, and I I wonder if Mike would be able to send his last remarks in an email if he's written anything about. Uh, I I think that would be very interesting. And yeah, third, if you, if you go on and, to, I'll I'll give you a, a website. We've got a website that we started called Blue Revolution. Um, oh, okay. And 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 the um. I don't know where to leave chat, but I can put the web address. But if you go onto that and you look at um, the booklet section, then you can download the four booklets I've written. I've, I'm writing oh. a fifth booklet at the moment about um, what next for the West, um, because we are in a, 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 a cultural and economic crisis. Um, and okay. we've got to come out of it with our rights intact. Um, and um, it, it kind of draws on the point that, in the 1930s, capitalism went into a crisis, uh, and you can see all across Europe what the consequences of that were in the rise okay. of, 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 of nationalism, nationalism and fascism. Uh, and we must avoid that happening again. Um, yes. but, but, and I, I don't often like to quote uh, people other than Marx and Engels, but as, as Trotsky pointed out, it, you know, when capitalism goes into crisis, the solution should be to empower the people. But bourgeois mm -hmm. systems do not want to empower the people. Yeah. And so our bourgeois systems tend to result uh, in dictatorial pop, pop, um, populists getting elected. And we're beginning to see that as well. And, and, and that is a big problem for me. You know, it really is a case that uh, we need to be finding methods and mechanisms politically now to empower more and more um, ordinary working people in major political decision making. We can't have an elite running around. I running think we need to pause here and move on to the next Personal okay, oh, I yeah, have one other, one other question. Is there Blue Revolution? Is that what you said? Yeah, www.bluerevolution.org and it's booklets tab. Okay, and if I may, can I ask one other question? I know almost nothing about, was it called the Open University after World War II? And people yeah. like Ray, Raymond Williams were involved. That yeah. wasn't the target um education for the british working class yeah yeah the, the open university was started as you say after the second world war uh, it was open to anybody in its first iterations you would watch television at three o'clock in the morning to get your lectures um and they were all um presented by by people with long hair and sandals um talking about uh, various obscure subjects but you'd have to stay up very late to watch it. But these, of course, this was in the day before 24 hour television. So uh, the BBC had an open university slot, which was from 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock onwards. Um, then, then you got um, uh, um, dis discs sent to you in the post so you could watch the lectures that way. And then now, of course, everything's done online. But yeah, you pay a reasonable sum of money for a lecture, but you get a first class education. I think actually open universities can considered to be on par with Oxford and Cambridge in terms of the quality of the education you can get from it. But wow. um, you, you simply you simply you know, pay for the pay for the courses. I know hey, a Mike. number of people who've got them. Hey, Mike, this is Gary. Um, you might want to explain to people, to the extent that you can, about the, this is this is ancient history now, World War II, the Victor Golan's book clubs. You might want to explain to folks what, what the, you know, if there's any lessons to be learned from that experience. Yeah, yeah. Well, absolutely. I, I mean, I know that I know the publisher. Um, and um, yeah, pr produced a lot of books that warning against the dangers of, um, uh, of, of fascism and promoting uh, Marxist ideas. But it's all very hazy. It's a long time ago. Yeah. Let's push on and let uh, Richard W. and Rich Johnson uh, talk for a little bit. We're approaching one o'clock. <clears throat> we turn into pumpkins. <laughs> Go ahead, Richard. Unmute yourself. Oh, am I unmuted? You're good now. I'm good? Well, you're audible, yes. That's what I want. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I would never want to be good. Um, so I wanted to get to, to something that you hinted at at the later stage of your presentation, Harry. Um, 
and that is the intersection of the university systems and the military, industrial, and I would include intelligence um, uh, complex. Uh, for example, down in Austin, Texas, we have uh, the Army Futures Command that just they just brought in. That's that's some what five six hundred people uh, that are working, you know, in, in the military. We have the Defense Initiatives uh, Experimental Unit, uh, which basically funds uh, military uh, mil military uh, corporations, businesses. Uh, and then what's very, very little known, apparently, is that there is a network of, um, of the uh, intelligence uh, programs for the University of Texas. Uh, it's centered out of the. Uh, it's centered out of the University of Texas, the LBJ School. It's a master's program, and um, and it's a network of, of the entire University of Texas um, uh, system. I believe that this extends to virtually every state in the United States. Uh, do you know anything about that? One, and two. Getting back to the. Um, you know, you know, getting back to the, the sort of the, the thing about Marx uh, said, uh, history always repeats itself. The first time is tragedy, the second time is farce. Um, I can't help but not believe that there are the same kinds of things going on that went on in the 60s, where you had this kind of conjoining of, of the Vietnam War uh, with labor interests in particular, uh, and, and, and centered around the, 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 the universities. But uh, uh, could you maybe talk a little bit more about that, if, if you know anything about it? Thanks. Uh, I'm not sure what, what, the, what the, the, the last part of your question. Um, um, what I do know about Purdue are these links with military contractors. Um, um, I think there's a program of uh, experts in, um, in computer technology and military related uh, cyber security programs. I do know from back in the day, and I don't know if it's true anymore, that for some reason, Notre Dame was a breeding ground for CIA agents. I uh, remember Philip Agee, for example, went to Notre Dame and there were, there were a number of others. Um, also, I do know that uh, various institutes at universities have formal or informal ties to the intelligence community. Uh, I think some of that the old David Horwitz had uh, had uncovered. Mm, yeah. um, um, from time to time, I think several years ago, uh, somebody from the CIA wanted a position in our department and our de department had denied it, which was really cool. Uh, so I, I would, I don't have any specifics, but I would imagine these kind of connections and networks are pervasive. And I would bet a lot of say China scholarship nowadays, uh, involves people who have ties with NSA or state department or other kind of agencies. So I have nothing specific to report, but I'm okay. not in any way, uh, surprised and, um, so the universities, as we know from the 60s, has been, has been a breeding ground of, quote, experts for promoting United States foreign policy, and we should be aware of that as well. Okay, Bob Shepard has his hand on, and then I'll put myself on the stack again. So, Bob, can you uh, unmute yourself? Bob, while we're waiting for that, let me just observe, I don't know how many of you uh, know that Gloria Steinem uh, was a CIA agent and she is actually proud of it. And oh, she, really? uh, so uh, we did a session on that uh, a couple of years ago before we started recording. So I uh, just wanted to throw that in and Bob Shepard, um, I believe no. has his hand raised, but refuses to unmute himself. No, I'm not. Please. So, 
Maybe that's a sign that we should um, end the session. And thank you, Harry. I think uh, you've done such a great job. You're going to have to come back. So uh, we do wonderful session. Thank you so much. Okay, great. And I hope I'm on the list now, and so I will join in future. Okay, great. You're on our list. Thank you. Yeah. Institute for the Critical Study of Society at the Niebuhr Propter Marxist Library receives no corporate funding, nor do we have any paid staff. We rely on the support of working class folks that share our commitment to the socialist legacy of Karl Marx. We continue to need funds to meet necessary expenses. Since we can no longer pass the hat, at our in-person forums, please send contributions to our treasurer either online via PayPal or by check. The PayPal ID is ICSS Sunday S U N D A Y at yahoo.com, and the name is Richard Fallenbaum. And checks may be made out to Richard Fallenbaum and sent to him at 1225 Nielsen Street, Berkeley, California, 94706. Fallenbaum is spelled F-A-L-L-E-N-B-A-U-M. To donate directly to the Marxist Library, send a check to the Niebuhr Proctor Marxist Library at 6501 Telegraph Avenue. Oakland, California, 94609, or di directly or donate online at www.paypal.me slash npml. Info for information, write to, to npml at marxistlibr.org. And the website is Marxist L.